be with you. Good morning and welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church as we've come to worship our triune God as his people. We're glad that you have joined us today. Uh, there are a few announcements, most of which can be found on page six of your bulletin. First of all, it's our pleasure to have our assistant pastor, Justin Sherritt, to minister the word and sacrament to us and to have the Congregation of Christ Church of the Hudson Valley with us today. May the Lord bless our fellowship time together. Sunday school classes will resume for all ages today. Robert David will be teaching the adult Sunday school class here in the sanctuary. Following the service today, you are welcome to take some of our beautiful Easter flowers home. And our regular evening worship service will be at 6 o'clock this evening. Uh, as we look forward to the coming week, just a reminder that Pastor Kevin is on a study leave until April 15th. Please contact an elder if you have uh, need of pastoral assistance, and please send your prayer requests to Joanne Weber. Tomorrow evening, we will begin an eight-week prayer and study group reading Paul Miller's book, The Praying Life, from 7 to 8 p.m. Please see me if you'd like to join in, and we'll make sure we get you a copy of that book. Next Sunday, we will have our monthly fellowship meal following Sunday school. Our faithful fellowship team asks that the congregation would bring main dishes, casseroles, salads, sides, and desserts. Please plan to come. As you pray this week, please remember to pray for the ministry of Beacon of Light Pregnancy Support Center as they support women facing the reality of an unplanned pregnancy. And also in the bulletin, you'll see an invitation for their annual banquet on April 18th. Our congregational meeting will be held on Sunday, May 19th at 11.45 a.m. Gary Berg, Ron Bonagora, and Bob Maucher will be standing for election for the Office of Ruling Elder, and John Grammer, Joe Hall, and Ethan Westland will be standing for election as deacons. And finally, if you are new to Westminster or to Christ Church, Please help us to get to know you better by filling out a visitor's card, which is in front of you in the pew. And also on the back of it is a place for you to put a prayer request, and you can put that right in the offering plate as it comes around. Please stand now as we begin our service. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let us come to God as he has called us to worship him. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us praise our God as he has breathed new life into us by his spirit. Hymn number 330.
Please be seated. We're assembled this morning before the face of the holy triune God of the universe. We are assembled here this morning before the infinitely wise, omniscient, all-knowing God. And we are assembled here as a people whose scripture tells us that the revealed things are for us and the secret things, those are for God. And yet we are a people who focus on the secret things. We grow anxious and our hearts are troubled trying to decipher the things that are not for us that in God's providence he has kept hidden from us. And we have not focused properly on the things that have been revealed to us, which would indeed sturdy our hearts, which would give us solace and would give us peace. And as such a people with misshapen priorities, it is good and fitting, it is necessary indeed, that at the beginning of our corporate worship together, we would confess our sins, and we will do so using your corporate prayer of confession, printed on page one of your bulletin, saying together, Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shatter the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We fail to proclaim the gospel in word and deed. We ignore your call to discipleship. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. God, lift up your heads and hear the good news of the gospel. The eternal son, in the person of Jesus Christ, he was sown in dishonor. And that same Jesus who was sown in dishonor, he has been raised in glory. We, the people of faith, for us, there are so many things that remain hidden for us, that remain unknown. And yet, standing right at the heart of our faith, there stands a proclamation that has been revealed and is known. The Jesus that you celebrated on Maundy Thursday, who commanded you to love one another and gave you that sacrament of his enduring, enduring love. The Jesus who was crucified on Good Friday and the Jesus who we celebrated his resurrection on Resurrection Sunday, that Jesus has been raised up by God. And of that, all of us are public witnesses. That has been revealed, and that should sturdy your heart. I assure you this morning that each and every one of you who put your faith in that Jesus, that his resurrection is indeed the foretaste of your bodily resurrection. By his work and his work alone, you have been reconciled, redeemed, washed. You are as pure and righteous right now through Jesus as you will ever be and you will see the face of God. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is very good news. Amen. Amen. Having been freely pardoned by the redeeming work of the Son, it is our joyful duty to respond by our reading of the law. Please rise as we res responsibly read of the law. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image. God is the spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Honor your father and your mother. For God commanded, he who speaks evil of the father or mother, let him surely die. You shall not kill. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. You shall not commit adultery. Everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You shall not steal. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, theft. These are what the pile of men. You shall not bear false witness. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. You shall not covet. Take heed and beware of all covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. People of God, hear these words. It is indeed because of what you celebrated last week, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we now <coughs> exchange the peace. And we exchange the peace because Christ is bodily resurrected. So we bodily shake hands and we bodily hug with our hearts inflamed, knowing that those that are in Christ, we will see them glorified, perfected anew in the kingdom of heaven. Let us continue the worship with the exchanging of the peace of God. As we prepare to hear God's word, let us pray. <clears throat> God of life, your spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Your spirit inspired the prophets and writers of scripture. Send your spirit now to give us light, encouragement, faith, and hope through the proclamation of the everlasting gospel. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament lesson is from Isaiah chapter 55 verses 1 through 13, let us hear and receive God's word to us. <clears throat> come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money on that which is not bread and your labor on that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me, hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, my sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and the nation that you did not know shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God, and of the Holy One of Israel, 
for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there but water the earth, making, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The New Testament lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Hear the word of the Lord. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in wisdom, in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. This is God's word to us. Please stand now as we continue the ministry of the word as we sing number 368.
God, please remain standing for the gospel lesson. The gospel this morning comes from Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. Mark 4, 1 through 20, hear now the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea and on the land, and he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seed fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was all alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among the thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Over at Christ Church, we've been preaching through the gospel of Mark. And our next sermon in that series happens to be from Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20, the gospel text that was just read. So that will be our sermon text for today, this parable of the sower, a text that all of you are certainly familiar with. It has been said that preaching the parables is a novice preacher's dream and an experienced preacher's nightmare. A young preacher comes along and says, okay, these seem simple enough a good place to jump in and start my ministry. After all, kids, children, can understand these stories. They're quite used to hearing allegorical and parabolic stories, so these are easy for them to assimilate. A more experienced minister might be a little more hesitant, knowing that these are stories with multiple layers and rich, rich depths. They are hard to plumb. They can and often do trip people up. And the church, the history of the church, it is littered with 1,000 really, really poorly done sermons on the parables. I've heard many of them myself, and I'm sure you've heard many of them yourselves. Our goal today is to do our very best to make sure that that number does not go up to 1,001. That's the goal. But I make no promises. Preaching the parables, it's a lot like playing golf. It's really, really easy to do it poorly. Really easy to do poorly. In regards to golf, that might be especially true in respect to former athletes, football players and baseball players. They think, man, I can turn around a 90 mile per hour fastball that's got movement on it. I can certainly crush this little white ball not moving resting on the ground or propped up on a stick for me. And when it comes to the parables, that ease of access 
these sort of surface level accessibility to the stories leads us to believe that we can really tee off on them, really get a hold of them. When in reality, a smooth, easy, humble approach, a layup, might be a better way to take the shot. So we're talking about old man golf here, or old man exegesis in this case. Simple approach to the decks. So we're going to try to keep the theological ball in play here, avoid the water traps of heresy and the thick rough of missing the historical moment, which when I hear these parables preached, that's what I often hear miss. The historical moment is often lacking. The first century context, what is Jesus saying to those around him? I think that's often missed, and it leads the telling of the parables to be misshapen. So we come today to the parable of the sower. It's a parable that you're all familiar with. So the task of listening afresh, being receptive, having ears to hear, that becomes all the more imperative, all the more important. You know, Jesus, he's a wonderful teacher. He meets people right where they are. But unlike the modern world, he doesn't meet them there to affirm their individuality. He doesn't meet them there because they're great and they're perfect and they're lovely just the way they are. He meets them there so that he might call them, call them to follow him, to follow him out of their darkness and into his glorious light. So here Jesus, the good teacher, the rabbi, he uses an analogy that his audience would be very familiar with, something that they would certainly connect with, sowing seeds. Sowing was a common agricultural activity and this, Jesus' world, is still very much an agrarian world. So that would resonate with them, that analogy, in a very, very powerful way. Whereas if he started to talk to them about golf, that probably wouldn't resonate very well with his first century audience. So the people of Israel, they would most assuredly take a slightly different approach to this text than you would. They would hear it in a slightly different way. But what we want to remember is that the best way, really the only proper way to read, to hear, and to interpret Jesus and his words is through the nexus, through the matrix, through the lens of Israel's history. If you're trying to make sense of Jesus' words apart from the backdrop of Israel's history, you're listening to Jesus' words out of context in a way that's going to lead to all sorts of problems. Listening to Jesus' words through the nexus of Israel's history, that was how these things had to be heard. That was true in Jesus' day. That's true right now for us. And that will be true in 500 years from now. Listening to Jesus' words through the nexus of Israel's history is how we must approach them. Interpreting Jesus' words through the lens of Jesus' history, that's what we just saw over at Christ Church just two weeks ago in Mark's gospel, when we looked at Jesus calling his 12 disciples. If you remember that text, those of you at Christ Church and those of you that have read your gospel of Mark, we talked about that calling of the 12 disciples being a sort of thunderbolt, especially in the context of Israel's history. This minister, this healer at the beginning of his ministry, he does not call to himself four guys or five guys, or 11 guys, or 13 guys, he calls to himself 12. Jesus was in a profound way saying, I am the new Israel. He is assembling all the peoples of God to himself. And we see that when we have the Old Testament backdrop. We see this in Christ's whole life, really. We see it in the way that he executes his primary offices in the way he executes his primary roles, both in his humiliation and in his exaltation. You know those primary roles. You know them from your catechism. right? Christ executes the roles of prophet and of priest and of king. And it's only when we know the contours and the curves of Israel's contorted history that we see how Christ is the fulfillment the perfected fulfillment of all of those roles. 
right? The hopes and fears of all the years. The hopes and fears of every prophet, every priest, and every king, they are met in Christ. They were all typological, all types of the true prophet, the true priest, the true king. They were all preparatory work so that we might have the eyes to see and the ears to hear when the true king speaks, when the true prophet brings his word, and when the true priest sacrifices for us. So yes, this parable today, it's a straightforward or relatively straightforward farming analogy. But it is also laced with the pretext of Israel's history. It is this story of the sower. It's on a macro level, a picture of God sowing Israel back into her own land after all of those years of exile. Or maybe more appropriately, it's the picture of God sowing the new Israel into the new land. And we miss a lot if we miss that. It's the story of God sowing the new Israel into a new land that has very little to do with Canaan. You know, Jesus, like a good teacher, he's always assuming that we know his previous words. Often, you run into trouble with that as a teacher if you just assume. You guys remember what I talked upon for like the last seven weeks? And this dude's like, never heard it before. But teachers assume that the things that they said before that their students would retain, that they would remember. And Jesus is always assuming that his audience knows his words. And that means he's assuming that they know the Old Testament. For those words are his words. After all, in the beginning was the word. And if we were more astute readers and hearers of the Bible, of his words, when we hear this parable of the sower, of the grass growing up, we would certainly be hearing echoes of Isaiah chapter 40. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. If we were astute listeners and readers of Jesus' word, we would be picking up notes that we heard Adam reading in our Old Testament lesson. We'd be picking up the notes of Isaiah 55. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. This is God's true story. This is the story behind the story that you see with your eyes, the story of the changing seasons. We often think that, oh, Jesus is using these analogies because we have the changing of the seasons. That's not a, true at all. We have the changing seasons because of the story of the sower. Right? The universe, all of the things that we see here, they are a lower register reality that are trying to hearken us to a higher register reality. This larger story is the reason why there are seasons and an agricultural world at all. Because they all bear a tiny witness they all cry out in their own way for a word that will come and produce a fruit that does not rot, a fruit that does not perish. Yes, the grass withers and the flowers, they will all fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever. So we should approach the parables through the larger context of Israel's history and through the lens of the Old Testament. Now, in that context, I'd have to ask all of us, what did the Jews expect of their Messiah? What did they think the kingdom would look like upon the Messiah's advent? Well, we all know. They thought it would look like military might, like a stampede of chariots. And here comes Jesus, 
the Messiah, the one that the 12 have already abandoned their lives to follow. And he says, you know, the kingdom is kind of like a farmer who just throwing seeds, faithfully doing his work. Much of that work is going to be in vain. Much of it's going to be futile. And like farming, this kingdom building, it's going to take patience. You don't plant the vineyard and drink the wine the same day. You just have to imagine the air going right out of the balloon. Right? We expected military might. We expected chariots. And you say, eh, it's a farmer. A lot of his work's going to be in vain. Probably not what they were hoping for. It's not exactly the pregame speech that the players want in order to go out and conquer the nations. Now, we are prone, at least it has been my experience, when I hear people talk about this parable, we are very prone to immediately jump to modern, present-day, practical applications of the text. But this parable is first and foremost about Jesus' own ministry. Yes, it's about your gospel spreading, but it's first and foremost about Jesus' own ministry. That is what is currently happening to him even as he is telling this parable. The kingdom has arrived. The word has arrived. The word is in flesh and dwelling among them. And even his own family, as we at Christ Church saw a few weeks ago in Mark chapter 3, even Jesus' own family, they're at home saying, I think this guy might be crazy. Let's go get him and reel him back in. He's embarrassing us. Jesus is telling everyone in this parable what is happening to him at that very moment. The word, the seed is being sown, and many a ground is not receptive to it. So Jesus tells the parable, and then he immediately, thankfully, explains the parable in verse 11, even calling it a secret. He tells the 12 after the parable these words. To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. Now, when Jesus says it's a secret, it's a secret. It's not a secret like some Gnostic mystery religion. But it's a secret like the way the Old Testament uses that word. That is to say it is something that is hidden until God reveals it. And he has revealed it in the person of Jesus Christ. So the master has been revealed. But as the British theologian Charles Cranfield notes, the incarnate word is not obvious. Only faith could recognize the Son of God in the lowly figure of Jesus of Nazareth. The secret of the kingdom of God is the secret of the person of Jesus. The secret of the kingdom of God is the secret of the person of Jesus. Here then is the mystery, the stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks, foolishness to the wise, foolishness to all of us who think that we must merit our right standing with God. The mystery is this, everything rests on a person. Everything rests on one person. Everything, 100% of everything, rests on Jesus. It's exactly what Paul will tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You heard that read as your New Testament lesson. Paul says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony. Now that word testimony there, it's literally translated mystery. Paul says, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the mystery of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's as if the message is so radical, so explosive, that it can't be told in a straightforward manner. Too many people would be offended. It would make no sense to anybody. 
So it's spoken in a parable. And then after speaking the parable, Jesus explains it to them. But before he explains it, he says that he speaks in parables for this remarkable reason. Why does Jesus speak in parables? We often think Jesus speaks in parables to make things easy for us so that we might understand. But Jesus tells us he speaks in parables for this reason, so that everyone would not understand. Verse 10 of your text. And when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables, and he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive. And they may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. That's a lot to handle. So what can we say here? Well, there's at least one thing we can say. These parables are not what we would expect. And they must force us to slow down. Right? That is for sure. The parables should force you to slow down. Go read Jesus' parable of the tenants and ask yourself as you're reading that, if you're writing the story, does it end like that? Is that what you expect to happen? No, the parables, they force us to slow down. There's a modern artist that I love by the name of Makoto Fujimura. He's a painter. And Fujimura said, there is no art if you are unwilling to let the paint dry. Simple and profound. There is no art if you are unwilling to let the paint dry. And we don't like to let paint dry. Art, poetry, parables, they take time. To understand the parables, to be fed by them, because they will keep feeding you. That requires that we be perceptive, persistent, and serious in our faith. Jesus' words are worth more than a quick once-over. It's almost as if we are to be still in order to know that he is God. And Jesus knew when telling this parable. He knew that people were not quite taking his words serious. And you might be thinking, of course they were taking his words seriously. Jesus has amassed to himself a large gathering at this point, has he not? He's got a lot of people following him. But people attract people, don't they? Crowds attract crowds. Sometimes something becomes the thing to do, the thing to see, the thing to hear. And seeing Jesus, hearing Jesus, has for many become the thing to see the thing to do, the thing to be around. It's almost like a fad. I think here, and some of you might relate to this, of somebody who might truly love a band, a group of musicians. You love their music. You love their lyrics. You feel like you really get them. You vibe with them in a special way. And then that band breaks through. They might have a hit radio single. And all of a sudden, that sort of hidden band, their shows are packed. And they're packed with all these people because of FOMO. They're packed with people with the fear of missing out. It becomes the thing to do. Now, the early loyal fan may often think to themselves, are you guys listening to what they're saying? I, I don't think you get it. No, no, you, didn't. you have to listen to the first album to know what they're saying on this album. But the people are there nonetheless. But maybe we aren't hearing. Well, we need to take Jesus' words seriously. We need to take them slowly. We need to listen to the entire canon of his musical catalog. And he starts this parable in verse 3 by saying, listen. End of sentence. Listen, exclamation point. So we need to listen. And when we listen well... We see in his parable that there's a lot of things going on, but the determining factor is the ground. Lots of stuff going on, but the determining factor in this parable is the ground. A receptive ground means a good harvest. 
a less than receptive ground, well, that means birds eating the seeds, the sun burning up the crops that have weak roots, or thorns choking out whatever springs up. The state of the ground is key. You see, the grace of God is freely available to all, and yet some will respond and others will not. The grace of God is freely available to all. Some will respond, others will not. Now, I want us to think for a moment about the original audience of this text. I want to think particularly here of the 12, those disciples, the ones that he just appointed. I want you to think for a minute what they might be thinking as Jesus is about to give this parable. Think about what they have witnessed. They've witnessed the healing powers of Jesus. That's what draws them in. And they have left everything for him. They've left their home. They've left their families. They've left their normal quality of life. And they're following around this itinerant healer. This would be a very, very precarious situation. Right? A lot of people in their family would be questioning them, thinking they've gone off the rails. So I want to think about these people. I want to study their psyche for a minute. And we need to remember that they're real people, real people after all. And once we remember that they're real people, we can do a much better job in our historical, psychological, anthropological, and our theological analysis of these men. You know, the wonderful yet oft forgotten beauty of doing historical analysis well, or the study of anthropology well, is that detachment from your subject is not necessary. But indeed, detachment from your subject is often a hindrance. What do I mean by that? You know, in the hard sciences, you need objective detachment from whatever you are studying. But in history, in anthropology, we are the things that we are studying. Right? We are people studying people. So we can give a good insight into what might have been the thinking of these people just by virtue of the fact that we're people. And we can place ourselves there. Now, so many historians, so many modern sociologists and anthropologists, they just fail to do this, especially when we write about ancient people. We write about ancient people, and oftentimes, even we in the church, we forget, like, these are people made in the image of God. And they're far closer to us than we could ever imagine. They're just like us. But we think, because they lived a long, long time ago, that the things that we think are far different than them. G.K. Chesterton, as he's prone to do, he absolutely nails this. He nails the idea of how bad modern anthropology, modern history, and modern sociology is. Chesterton writes these words. He's pretending to be an anthropologist here. He says, you know, the natives of mumbo jumbo land believe that the dead man can eat and will require food upon his journey to the other world. This is attested by the fact that they put food in the grave. You read an old history book, especially about ancient people, isn't what you read? And you're prone when you're reading, you just go, oh, yeah, interesting. The, you know, the ancient Egyptians, they thought that people could eat after they died because we found a bunch of broken pots, food pots, around their... For the anthropologist, having detached himself from his humanity, that might make a great deal of sense. To the layperson, to you and I, the one still acquainted with what it's like to be a human, that comes across as madness. Wait, you're telling me the dead, they thought the dead people could eat because you found some bowls of food around their graves? Right, that would be similar to somebody coming in 500 years from now and saying, you know, the 21st century Americans of Rock Tavern, they believe that the dead people could smell. And this is attested to by the fact that we would find their graves covered in lilies and violets and flowers. So certainly the 21st century Rock Tavernians, they believe that the dead could smell. And we would say, what kind of an anthropologist are you? What a ridiculous thing, thing to believe. Now, it might be the case, I doubt it, that ancient men believed that the dead could eat. But it's no more a fact 
than stating that we believe that the dead men in Rock Tavern can smell. You see, mankind does certain things just because it's natural for them to do so. And it's hard to explain the emotions that brings us to this conclusion, the conclusion that it's natural. But that does not mean it's not so. Right? Most human emotions are irrational. And hence, they can't be explained in scientific terminology. Human emotions, many times being irrational, cannot be quantified scientifically. Right? So maybe those in mumbo jumbo land put food in the graves because food is one of the great joys of life. Maybe they did it to attract animals to the bodies so that the souls could come out and pop into the bodies of the animals and they could live on that way. But maybe they did it because they just felt like it was the proper thing to do. They were sad that dad was gone and they wanted to bring him his favorite meal. Maybe they did it because it felt natural. And what is natural to man is not the business of science. So all of us being humans, I want you to be a human for a minute here. Think for a second what you might be thinking. Think about the doubts you might have if you were one of the 12. Imagine you were just called by Jesus. You're following Jesus. And this has radically changed your life. It's upset it. It's thrown it into turmoil. And you have to be thinking somewhere in the recesses of your mind, hey, if this guy is who we think he is, if this guy is who we believe that he just might be, then how come not everyone believes him? How come all the wise guys, the scribes, the Pharisees, how come they're not listening to his words? Right? We have these same doubts, right? You ever start believing something you're like, but all the smart people don't believe this. That should give you pause. It looks like maybe even his own family is not responding to his words. They're not responding to his grace. This would cause a lot of doubt. It would raise some questions. Why do the words take root in some and not others? It's a big question. Now, guess what? Neither the parable nor Jesus' explanation of the parable will tell us why this is the case. And that's hard for us, right? The uncertainty of knowing why has the word of God taken root in my heart and not my, fa my father's heart? Why not? Why is it taking root in the heart of one of my children and not my other child? As my favorite hymn in hymn, he says, Lord, why was I made to hear your voice and enter while there's room when thousands make the wretched choice and would rather starve than come? Why do the words take root for some but not others? We don't get an answer. But we do see something here. God seems to respect agency. God is a respecter of free wills. He is a respecter of moral decision making. He will not shove grace down anyone's throat. I mean, think of these heartbreaking words from Jesus right towards the very end of his life. Matthew 23, 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. And you were not willing. Human agency, human will is respected by God. The disciples... You and I, we are servants of Jesus. We are servants of the gospel. So we are not in control of the gospel or the effects of the gospel. We cannot, nor should we attempt to manipulate the gospel to make it more palatable to modern ears. We do that all the time. I see that with people like, well, I'm not going to give the hard edge of the gospel because I want the gospel to actually work in this person. 
Read the parable of the sower. We should not manipulate the gospel to make it more palatable to modern ears. Nor should we fret over whether or not it will produce a harvest. If the seeds we throw produce fruit, that's in God's hands. Now, this is not a license for laziness or haphazard approaches to ministry. This is a farming analogy after all, is it not? The farmer, the good farmer, he plans. He studies his land. He knows it well. Go talk to Bennett Sippel over there. Go follow him online over at North Haven Pastures. Look at the care, the detailed care and concern he puts into his regenerative farming, into the farming of his animals. The good farmer plans. He labors. He works to do everything in his control to produce growth and a healthy cattle. And then the rest, it's in the Lord's hands. The farmer plays a big part, but it's only part. And when the crop doesn't come in, when the animal dies, it's going to hurt. To live, to farm, is to risk frustration and failure. But what does Paul tell us in that same passage, passage that we mentioned earlier when he talks about the mystery of the gospel? This is what Paul says. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Your faith does not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Beloved, your faith rests in the power of God. And in regards to others, throw the beautiful true, good words of the gospel on the grounds of their heart, on the ground of their mind. Do it in good faith. Do it with joy. Do it with love. And then rest assured, rest secure, that the results rest not in your frail, weak hands. They rest not in your wisdom, but they rest in the wisdom and power of God. The results rest in the hands of God. And that is a wonderful place for all results to be. Amen. Amen. Please rise with me as we continue to worship with the recitation of the Nicene Creed found on page three of your bulletin. People of God, in whom do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Heavenly Father, it is with great humility that we come before your throne asking with the songwriter, why was it that we were made to hear your voice and enter while there's room when thousands make the wretched choice and would rather starve than come? Father, we deserve not your mercies and yet in your gracious providential plan that you have predestined us before the foundations of the world. You have elected us to have your Holy Spirit rejuvenate our hearts, that indeed we might come 
to rest upon Jesus as our rock and our salvation. We thank you for this great mystery, this stumbling block to the Greeks and to the Jews, to the wise and to the proud, this stumbling block of simplicity that indeed everything, every last thing rests on one person. Help us to indeed rest upon this person. Help us to be people who are not anxious about the things that we cannot know, the things that we cannot control. But make us a people who throw good, true, and beautiful seeds on the hearts and on the minds of all of those around us, knowing that the results rest in your omnipotent, omniscient, loving, merciful, caring hands. And having thrown the seeds, may we then come together with refreshed hearts and rejoice as your people, knowing that you are good and you will reconcile all things to yourself. Father God, give us this joy, give us this peace that you have promised, a peace that surpasses all possible human understanding. Father God, we lift up your people now and we pray for your people here at Westminster Presbyterian Church and your people here at Christ Church of the Hudson Valley. We pray that you'd be with Wilma DeJager as she's had this setback and remains in the hospital. Be her comfort and her strength. We pray for Donna Conklin, our sister, who has suffered for so, so long and who must cry out in the depths of her soul, why God, why? Help her not to feel forsaken, but indeed to feel loved. Loved by your community here at Westminster and most of all loved by the son who has predestined her for adoption before the foundations of the world. And indeed, as we exchange the peace and anticipated bodily resurrection, she can anticipate a bodily resurrection where she will be magnificent, radiant, and made whole. Father God, we pray for the work of your people in this congregation, particularly over at Redeemer Broadcasting. May they continue to sow seeds out into a dark world, many times feeling that that work might indeed be futile, might indeed might be burnt up by the sun and taken away by the beasts of the air. Help them to sow true, good, beautiful seeds of the gospel through their radio networks, knowing that the harvest is in your hands. Strengthen all of those that are involved in that ministry. Guard their hearts. Protect them, knowing that indeed they are doing what you have commanded them to do. Likewise, Father God, we lift up the missionaries of your church, oftentimes feeling that their labor might be in vain, not seeing the physical fruit of the labor. And yet, just like with farming, Father God, so much is going on underneath the surface. So much is being brought to life out of those seeds that are sown in death. Encourage them, strengthen them, be with them. Father God, we lift up all of your people here. Strengthen all of us. Help us to continue to throw seeds, knowing that Christ is the grand sower, and it is in his name that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Freely you have received the good gift of the gospel. Freely give. Let us continue to worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings.
up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that indeed the gospel, which is too big for us, is not in our hands. Indeed, we are not responsible for the gospel, but are servants of it. We are thankful indeed that everything rests on a person. And we are thankful that indeed that person, when we lack the words, he has taught all of us how to pray. Saying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Beloved, it is at this table, week after week, that we see the seed that was sown in dishonor. And simultaneously, we see the seed that has been raised up in glory. This is the grand sowing of the gospel into the world. The true gospel with all of its rough, hard edges. Here the gospel week after week is sown into this community and a public witness is made of the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Here, the gospel goes forth with power and with might. Because Christ has promised in a sacramental way to meet us here by faith. This is the meal that is sown into your hearts, sown into your minds, and sown into your very mouth. That the good word of Jesus might grow up in you. That it might fortify you. That the kingdom might be built within each and every one of us. For indeed, by faith, you are a temple of the Holy Ghost. And so you come to this majestic, mystical communion of Christ now in such a way that you feast with all of the saints that have gone before. You are lifted up into the highest heavens and you feast with the angels and you feast with the saints who have been perfected before the face of the triune God. This is the medicine of immortality. This is the grand feast of the harvest. This is where we come to rejoice in the goodness that the gospel has been accomplished for us. It does not rest in our hands, but it is graciously, by the love of God, placed into our mouths. It is placed into our hearts. None of us contain this meal. None of us contain this gospel. But we can, and indeed we will, proclaim it until Christ comes again in glory to judge the living and the dead when we will eat this meal anew with him in his Father's kingdom. This is a meal that is not for the righteous. It's not for the good. It is for broken sowers who know that they need this, the grand sower, the perfecter of his people. So I invite all of you who have received Christian baptism, who look to this Jesus and this Jesus alone for your salvation, those of you who discern the broken body and shed blood before you, and who can discern this body planted before the foundations of the world. If you can do that, I invite you to come to this meal. Nevertheless, there are warnings in Scripture about coming to this meal in a less than proper manner. And if you do not meet those qualifications, I would ask that you refrain from this meal and use this as a time to meditate on your dire need for this, the one sown in dishonor, Raised in glory. Let us pray for the meal. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful, beautiful mystery. We thank you for the gospel that is presented before us, before all of our senses. We pray now for all of those of us that were hard of hearing in the preaching of the word and the reading of the word, that they would not be hard of tasting, tasting the goodness of your love tasting of your body broken for them, tasting of your blood shed for them. Have this be a meal of solemn remembrance 
and a meal of exuberant rejoicing, an anticipatory meal, even now as we are lifted up in a veiled way into the highest heaven to feast with those who have come before. Bless this meal. Bless your people. For Christ's sake, amen. Scripture tells us that in the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. As often as you gather, do this in remembrance of me. Let us receive the body of Christ. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him, one after the another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine till that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The Apostle Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. This is the body of Christ, sown in dishonor, raised in magnificent glory. Take, eat, all of you. Scripture records that in the same manner, after the breaking of the bread, our Lord took the cup pouring it, and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. This is my blood shed for the remission of sins of many. Let us receive from Christ the medicine of immortality, the blood of Christ. I would remind you that the outer ring alone is grape juice.
This sacrament is indeed the seal of the word that you have heard read, the word that you have heard preached. Let this be a sealing ordinance for each and every one of us. The blood of Christ shed for the remission of sins. Amen. Our hymn of departure is number 334. 334. God as you go, I charge you to be anxious about nothing, but instead to sow the true, good, and beautiful seeds of the gospel, knowing that it rests fully in the hands of the Almighty God. And instead of being anxious, instead meditate upon these things as you go. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen.